Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr. Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number 11, ready for teaching on December 10. It's titled End Time Deceptions, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we come to lesson number 11 in this series that we can have more confidence in you from what we've learned as we've opened your word and your Holy Spirit has revealed to us through these lessons that there is salvation in Jesus, there is hope for the future for us, and that we can have our full confidence in you. And as we open your word this week with the lesson titled End Time Deceptions, we pray that your Holy Spirit will again be with us and bless us regardless of where we are listening. And today I'd like to particularly pray for those who are listening in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in Eswatini, in Africa, in Tanzania, in Tonga, in the Pacific, in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Caribbean, along with Turks and Caicos Islands, and Tuvalu in the Pacific Islands and Uganda in Africa and Vanuatu in the Pacific and Wales in the United Kingdom and Zambia again in Africa. Lord, there are people listening to you all around the world through these lessons and we pray that each one will be blessed individually, even those we haven't named today, Lord. Bless us as we open your word. May it not just be a time of study and reflection but also a time when we come to know you as the God above all gods, the only God, the creator of the universe. May we know that you are the one that we can trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, and this week it comes from the New Revised Standard Version. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Their end will match their deeds. Let's read that again. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 14 and 15. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Their end will match their deeds. Our contemporary world has become a melting pot of the supernatural and the mystical, helped on by Hollywood, which has no problem making movies with religious and mystical themes in a hodgepodge of error and deception. The old lie... You surely will not die, of Genesis 3 verse 4, also has inspired some of the most read books and most watched movies of the past few decades, and many popular video games as well. Undeniably, we are exposed to and tempted by the enchanted ground of Satan, which can appear in myriad forms, and even, in some cases, can come hidden under the veneer of science. One of the most deceptive phenomena has been what has been called near-death experiences, or NDEs, where those who have died have come back to life with stories of an afterlife. Many people have seen these events as proof of an immortal soul. During this week, we will consider some end-time deceptions, including mysticism, near-death experiences, reincarnation, necromancy and ancestor worship and others. These are dangerous subjects that we should be aware of, but without exposing ourselves to their influences. Sunday, December 4, Mysticism Our world has been flooded by the strong waves of mysticism. 
The word mysticism is a complex term that encapsulates a huge variety of ideas. From a religious perspective, the word implies the union of the individual with the divine or absolute in some kind of spiritual experience or trance. This characterises the worship experience even of certain churches. The phenomena can vary in form and intensity, but the tendency always is to replace the authority of the written word of God with one's own subjective experiences. In any case, the Bible loses much of its doctrinal function and the Christian remains vulnerable to his or her own experiences. This kind of subjective religion does not provide a safeguard against any deception, especially end-time ones. Read Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 27. In light of Jesus' own words, what does it mean to build our spiritual house on the rock, or to build it on the sand? Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." There is a strong tendency in the postmodern Christian world to downplay the relevance of biblical doctrines, regarding them as tedious echoes of an obsolete form of religion. In this process, the teachings of Christ are artificially replaced by the person of Christ, arguing, for instance, that some biblical story or another cannot be true because Jesus as they perceive him, would never have allowed that to happen as it is written. Personal feelings and taste end up being the criteria for interpreting the scriptures or even for rejecting outright what the Bible clearly teaches, often about obedience to God, which, as Jesus said, is so essential to building one's house on the rock. Those who think that it matters not what they believe in doctrine, so long as they believe in Jesus Christ, are on dangerous grounds. The Roman inquisitors, who condemned to death untold number of Protestants, believed in Jesus Christ. Those who had cast out demons in Christ's name in Matthew 7.22 had believed in him. We read in The Great Controversy, page 520, the position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the believer. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel. End of quote. And so to finish today... How can we fight the very human tendency to let our emotions and desires cause us to do things contrary to the Word of God? Monday, December 5, Near-Death Experiences Some of the most popular modern arguments to prove the theory of natural immortality of the soul are near-death experiences. In his book, Life After Life, The Investigation of a Phenomenon, Survival of Bodily Death, by Raymond A. Moody, Jr., 
presented the results of his five-year study of more than 100 people who experienced clinical death and were revived. These individuals claimed to have seen a loving and warm being of light before coming back to life. This has been regarded as exciting evidence of the survival of the human spirit beyond death. Well, that's a comment on the back cover. Over the years, many other similar books have been published promoting the same idea. And we had a look at that back in Lesson 2. Read the resurrection accounts of 1 Kings 17, 2 Kings 4, Mark 5, Luke 7 and John 11... How many of them talk about any kind of conscious existence while the resurrected ones were dead? And why is that answer important? First of all, 1 Kings 17, verses 22 to 24. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. And 2 Kings 4, 34-37, And he went up and lay on the child, and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house, and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. And Mark five forty one to 43. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. And Luke 7, verses 14 to 17, Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. And John 11, verses 40 to 44, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you send me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. All near-death experiences reported in modern literature are of people considered clinically dead, but not really dead, in contrast to Lazarus, who was dead for four days and whose corpse was rotting, as we read in a lesson recently in John 11.39. Neither Lazarus nor any of those raised from the dead in biblical times ever mentioned any afterlife experience, whether in paradise, in purgatory or in hell. This is indeed an argument from silence, but it is in full agreement with the biblical teachings on the unconscious state of the dead. But what about the near-death experiences so commonly recounted today? If we accept the biblical teaching of the unconsciousness of the dead, which we've recently gone through in Job 3, 11 to 13, and Psalm 115, verse 17, and Psalm 146, verse 4, and Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, 
then we are left with two main possibilities. Either it is a natural psychochemical hallucination under extreme conditions, or it can be a supernatural satanic deceptive experience. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Satanic deception could indeed be the explanation, especially because in some cases these people claim to have talked to their dead relatives. But it could be a combination of both factors. With this deception prevalent and so convincing to many, it is crucial that we stick firmly to the teaching of the Word of God, despite whatever experiences we or others might have that go against what the Bible teaches. And so to finish today, how fascinating that NDEs, knee-death experiences, often now come with the imprimatur of science. What does this teach us about how careful we need to be, even of things that science supposedly proves? Tuesday, December 6. Reincarnation The pagan notion of an immortal soul provides the foundation for the unbiblical theory of reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. This theory has been adopted by some major world religions. While most Christians believe in the existence of an immortal soul that abides in a permanent heaven or hell after death, those who believe in reincarnation hold that such an immortal soul goes through many cycles of death and rebirth here on earth. For some, reincarnation is thought to be a process of spiritual evolution that allows the spirit to attain even greater levels of knowledge and morality in its journey toward perfection. Hindus believe that the eternal soul goes through a progression of consciousness or samsara in six classes of life – aquatics, plants, reptiles and insects, birds, animals and human beings, including the residents of heaven. Read Hebrews 9 verses 25 to 28 and 1 Peter 3.18. If Jesus died just once, and likewise all human beings die just once, why do even some alleged Christians believe in some form of reincarnation? Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 25. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Many people believe not in what they should believe, but in what they want to believe. If a theory brings them existential peace and comfort, that is enough to settle the discussion for them. But for those who take the Bible seriously, there is no way to accept the theory of reincarnation. First, this theory contradicts the biblical teachings of the mortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord 
will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Second, it negates the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and replaces it with human works. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Third, the theory contradicts the biblical teaching that one's eternal destiny is decided forever by one's decisions in this life. As we read in Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find... Invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And then in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, 
Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Fourth, this theory downplays the meaning and relevance of Christ's second coming, as we read in John fourteen one to 3 Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And fifth, the theory proposes after-death opportunities for someone still to overcome his or her own life's pitfalls, which is unbiblical, as we read in Hebrews 9.27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. In short, there is no place for the idea of reincarnation in the Christian faith. Wednesday, December 7, Necromancy and Ancestor Worship The word necromancy derives from the Greek terms necros, dead, and mantia, divination. Practiced since ancient times, necromancy is a form of summoning the alleged active spirits of the dead in order to obtain knowledge often about future events. Ancestor worship, meantime, is the custom of venerating deceased ancestors because they are still considered family and these spirits can, it is believed, influence the affairs of the living. These pagan practices can be very attractive to those who believe in an immortal soul and who also miss their deceased loved ones. Read 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 25. What spiritual lessons against any supposed communication with the dead can be drawn from Saul's experience with the woman medium at Endor? 1 Samuel chapter 28, beginning at verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. 
Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbour David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground, and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul, and saw that he was severely troubled, and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands, and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now therefore please heed also the voice of your maidservant and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house and she hastened to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. The Bible stated very clearly that all spiritists, mediums, sources, and necromancers in the ancient Israelite theocracy were abominations to the Lord and shall be put to death by stoning. And we read that in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. And verse 27. A man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. And Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 9 to 14. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. In accordance with this law, Saul had destroyed all mediums and spiritists from Israel, as we read in 1 Samuel 23, verses 3 and in verse 9. But then, after being rejected by the Lord, Saul himself went to the Canaanite city of Endor to inquire of a woman medium. And we read about that in verses 6 and 7 and 15. Let's have a look at Joshua 17, verse 11. And in Isaac and in Asher, Manasseh had Beth Shin and its towns, Iblim and its towns, the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, the inhabitants of Endor and its towns, the inhabitants of Tarnak and its towns, and the inhabitants of Midigo and its town, three hilly regions. 
And we'll also compare Psalm 83 verse 10, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. He asked her to bring up the deceased prophet Samuel, who supposedly came up in a necromancer apparition and spoke with Saul, as we read in verses 13 to 19 of 1 Samuel 28. The deceiving spirit who pretended to be Samuel told Saul in verse 19, Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. While predicting Saul's death, that deceiving spirit, merely by assuming the form of Samuel, reaffirmed the unbiblical theory of the natural immortality of the soul. It was a powerful deception, and Saul should have known better than to become involved with what he had previously condemned. More than two centuries later, the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And we'll also look at Isaiah 19 and verse 3. And that reads, The spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy their counsel, and they will consult the idols and the charmers, the mediums and the sorcerers. And so to finish the day, how often under stress do we do things that we know are wrong? Why are faith prayer and obedience to the word of God, our only sure defence against ourselves. Thursday, December 8. Personations and Other Appearances Similar to necromancy are the demonic personations of the dead and other demonic appearances. The personations can be in the form of a deceased family member, friend or anyone. Both the physical appearance and the voice are very similar to those of the deceased. All these satanic deceptions will be used to deceive those who are not firmly grounded in God's word. In... The Great Controversy, page 557, we read, The apostles, as personated by these lying spirits, are made to contradict what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth. And further, in page 624, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, and Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. What should be our safeguards against such demonic deceptions? 2 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. And Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
The Apostle Paul warns us that our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6.12. We can be protected against these deceptions only by being clothed with the whole armour of God, as we read in the following verse. And that was described in Ephesians 6.13-18. to the satanic personations and appearances can be very frightening and deceiving, but they cannot mislead those who are sheltered by God and grounded in God's word. From a doctrinal perspective, those who believe in the biblical doctrine of the conditional immortality of human beings know that any appearance of or communication with the dead is of a satanic origin and needs to be rejected by God's powerful grace. Again, no matter how powerful, convincing and seemingly real the manifestation is, we must always stand firm on the teaching that the dead are asleep in the grave. Imagine, though, losing a loved one and then believing that this same loved one appears to you and expresses love to you and tells you how much they miss you and says things that, yes, only they would know, and says that they are now in a better place. If a person is not absolutely grounded in what the Bible teaches about the state of the dead, think of how easily he or she could fall for this deception, especially because they want to believe it as well. And so to finish the day, what does it mean to put on the whole armour of God? In a day-to-day -day practical sense, how do we do this in every area of our lives, not just in dealing with end-time deceptions? Friday, December 9. There exists a foundation which claims that it is creating technology that will allow us to contact the deceased via texts, phone calls and video conferencing. Calling the dead PMPs, post-material persons, its website claims that when humans die, they simply pass on into another phase of forever, but retain their consciousness, identity and core aspects of their previous physical form. But most important, the soul phone folks claim to be developing in three phases technology that will allow communication between material and post-material persons. The first phase will allow texting and typing with post-material family friends and experts in every field of expertise. Phase 2 is supposed to enable talking with your dear ones who are living in another part of forever. And the third phase, it says, will open the way to hearing and seeing those who are experiencing the field of all possibilities from a different observation point. Especially scary is how they test if the communicating dead are really who they claim to be. For example, the site says, a bereaved parent might ask the following question of a son or daughter who has changed worlds. Did you have a dog named Snoopy when you were a child? Did we give you a pocket knife for your 10th birthday? How interesting, in light of this warning, we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 684, spiritual beings sometimes appear to persons in the form of their deceased friends and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions this week. One, using the excuse of being culturally acceptable, many Christians consume whatever the media promotes. While biblical principles should guide our relationship with the media, especially when it openly promotes views that we know are wrong and deceptive. 
Let's have a look at Psalm 101, verses 1 to 8. I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slays and as his neighbour, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. And Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And number two, how can we help others to overcome Satan's end-time deceptions without being exposed to the deceiving influence of those very same deceptions ourselves? And three, many Christians have seen the story of having Samuel summoned from the grave as biblical proof that the dead live on. What does this account teach us about why we cannot rely only on a single text or story to build a doctrine, but instead we must look at all that the Bible says about a topic? And now for Inside Story, a mission story with Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. A Daring Witness by Rick McEdward. At the beginning of the semester, a university classmate asked Sandra if he could take a picture of her class notes with his cell phone. I saw that you were writing in English, he said. I want to improve my English. Classes were not taught in English at the university in the Middle East. But English was Sandra's native language and she found it easier to take notes in English. Here you are, Sandra said, extending her notebook. The next day the classmate again asked for permission to take pictures. After the classmate asked to take pictures for several days in a row, Sandra decided to be more intentional with her notes. She resolved to write favourite Bible verses at the bottom of the pages of her notebook. The next time the classmate asked to take a picture, however, Sandra felt a jolt of fear. She worried that he would notice the verses and stop asking to see her notes. She prayed that God would use the Bible verses for his glory. The classmate did not seem to notice the Bible verses at first. But after a couple of days, he realised that the notes contained information that the teacher had not mentioned during the class lectures. He went to Sandra and pointed to a verse at the bottom of a page. Is this a verse from the Bible, he asked. Yes, Sandra said, her mind racing as she wondered how to explain it. The classmate paused. Is this the way you motivate yourself, he asked. Sandra smiled with relief. Exactly, she said. I write my favourite verses in my notebook. They are always really helpful and useful for my life. After that day, the classmate asked Sandra many questions about her religion and beliefs. As they studied together at the university, he also learned about the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At the end of the semester, he asked to make a copy of Sandra's entire verse-filled notebook. He wanted to share the notes with his siblings. Although Sandra has not studied with him again, the two have kept in touch, and he regularly asks for advice about life. Sandra is praying for him, his siblings and the rest of his family. 
She thanks God for giving her the daring idea to write Bible verses at the bottom of the pages of her notebook. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.